OK, let's consider disclosure control in a little bit more detail. First of all, if you're going to use any system that promises some element of disclosure control, there are a number of issues you should think of. First of all, you must never promise complete removal of any risk of disclosure. There is always some way around that someone who's malevolent enough could go in order to try and break in, even this if this involves, for example, going back to look at actual hard copy paper records. So what you basically should be trying to do is to the effort you're going to expend on trying to ensure disclosure control should balance the real risk of such disclosure and the real costs associated with it. This, for example, means that it obviously uh, the amount of effort you should expend depends upon uh, how sensitive the data are and, for example, how stigmatizing any data release might be. So this means that because the whole of disclosure control is a contextual issue that needs to be matched up to each new problem as it, as it arrives, there's no sense in which you can ever say, great, that's done, I've sorted disclosure control. It's always an ongoing process in terms of thinking what you need to do for the current new problem. So rather than trying to persuade study participants, data generators and data custodians that there is no risk of disclosure control, no risk of disclosure, what we should basically be aiming to do is to demonstrate to them that we are doing everything reasonable to try to reduce the risk of disclosure to an acceptable level. And uh, one of the ways that, that we can do that is by setting these uh, thresholds for the disclosure traps that are sitting in the server side functions. One of the purposes of the, of the disclosure traps is that they make it should make it difficult for someone to get around them without doing some form of analysis that then could be detected uh, either while it's happening or, or post hoc. So for example, if you put the threshold on the minimum cell size in a contingency table to three, then in order to uh, get around that block, if you can find some additional information elsewhere, you would need to solve some sim simultaneous linear equations. Uh, this would appear in the analytic record and therefore could lead to people identifying this particular uh, disclosive activity post-hoc. On the other hand, without uh, such a uh, threshold being set, uh, or if it's set to one, so all tables are ex accepted, then under these circumstances, you can basically sometimes get a disclosure event occurring with no special analysis required at all. So basically that's part of the purpose for setting the disclosure traps. Now in answering that particular point, we note we're emphasizing the importance of uh, being able to look post hoc at the analyses that were actually done. So uh, the, it is important that disclosure controls should include a permanent record of all the commands and outputs which have come from a, uh, in a particular analysis. And these should be basically being uh, logged on the data server under the control of the data custodian so that that person can then look at them later on. And the key reason for that, as I already emphasized, is that this allows postdoc investigation of disclosure events. Um, and these can then be compared to what was actually listed in the formal governance agreements. And if someone has done something that's led to a disclosure that breaks the agreements that they had, then in that case, it's possible to go in, uh, identify this, and then to apply sanctions to that person or that group, which may basically involve preventing them being able to use uh, data shield again for a, a period of time. Okay, some final thoughts about data shield generally. The first thing to say is that like any other approach to analysis or joint co-analysis, there is little point, and in fact there's some danger, in, in applying data shield to data unless they have first been cleaned and harmonized. Unless you go through that process, then the data could well be uh, mis misleading. So this is work that is carried outside, carried out outside data shield generally, um, though we are looking at ways to build in some aspects of this into the operation of data shield itself. And it's important to recognize that these initial data preparation steps, um, in particular, in fact, both the data cleaning and the harmonization can take actually more time than working on the data shield analysis itself. 
So uh, it's also a second next recommendation is that the Opal servers that contain the data uh, and into which the data shield is embedded should be kept separate from the main servers holding the main data systems for a study. Uh, as we've already said uh, a few slides ago, um, but another point is that data where possible should be pseudonymized. So you shouldn't be actually using data with direct identifiers in it, like uh, unique IDs or um, full dates of birth or full postcodes. Um, these basically should be stripped from the data before it's made available through Data Shield, unless there is a particular reason for those things to be required for a particular analysis. One of the uh, next point to make is that one of the big arguments uh, in over, well, over the years in terms of uh, access to health science data is the arguments between the complementary strengths of central warehousing and remote federated analysis. Our view very strongly is that these are complementary, these two approaches, sometimes one is required and sometimes the other. Um, Data Shield has been designed with a particular uh, value of the latter of the federated analysis being considered. But as we saw with the, uh, the single site Data Shield, the Data Shield can also be applied to uh, data that has been centrally warehoused. So Data Shield can be applied in both settings, but crucially, unlike most other settings, other systems, it does allow federated analysis in an efficient and feasible manner. Finally, a, a sort of uh, fi uh, a key point to note in finishing is that Data Shield undoubtedly provides an effective solution to a range of challenges in data management, but it is not always appropriate. And therefore, it's important that people don't think that just by using Data Shield, they've resolved all the problems that they've got in terms of their of dealing with their data, particularly their sensitive data. It's always important to explore the risks and costs of data disclosure, how to prevent it, um, to explore those before you actually embark on any particular project.